Welcome uh, to Trinity Covenant Church. Welcome to a new year. It's a privilege to be back uh, here on the pulpit to speak and share God's word. We appreciated so much last Sunday's uh, message by Mike uh, DeStefano and just a reminder of how we need to continue to move outward uh, in mission in our lives. And just a reminder, especially uh, him being a millennial himself, uh, that our vision has to include not only a multi-ethnic vision, but a multi-generational vision. And that's something that really got impressed upon my heart with the 20s and 30s generation. Um, this morning we want to look at, uh, probably for some, a story that you have heard uh, Jesus share. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 21, as we launch a new series that I'm excited to talk about over the next couple of Sundays, Greater Things. Greater things, expecting uh, God-sized expectations uh, for this new year. And we want to talk about greater pursuit as we launch off our series uh, here and one of the early Sundays of the year. Luke 15, 11 through 21. We'll look at the uh, rest of the story, but we'll start with those uh, verses. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And we'll stop there for now. Will you join me in a brief word of prayer? We'll jump right in to this morning's message. Gracious Father, thank you for a wonderful start to the new year. A lot has happened in so many of our lives already these first few weeks. And we ask for your grace for those that find themselves already overwhelmed. And we give you thanksgiving for a lot of the great things and celebrations that have taken place already in our lives and among our loved ones. Father, we pray for your grace as we begin this new year. Because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us, we indeed can expect greater things in this new year. Not by becoming a better person or improving our life skills, but in looking to a God who indeed is able to do great things, wanting to do great things, and with anticipation and expectation we begin this new year together expecting greater things that are still yet to come in jesus christ so father be with us we thank you we worship you and we acknowledge that you are lord and king and so grant us your mercy as we look into your word in the name of jesus amen This story is often a truly beloved story that we know that Jesus shared in a series of stories called parables. It is coupled often with other stories about the theme of lost things being found. Often in stories that we have heard, for some of us with the privilege of growing up in church and some, uh, some familiarity with scriptures, we often uh, hear these stories and we have a particular perspective or understanding uh, of those stories. But I think as we take a brief look at this 
well-known story of the prodigal son that I think certain elements as we go through it together will stand out hopefully in a new, fresh, and challenging way. So the greater pursuit. There are four things we're going to look at this morning. First of all, the first lost son. Secondly, a life-changing embrace. Thirdly, the second lost son. And fourthly and finally, a running father. For those children that are doing the church chat, the study guide will go back to these four things. So don't worry about it if you didn't have a chance to write it down. First of all, the first lost son. Here you have a son who begins, Father, give me my share of the estate. He's asking the father for his inheritance while the father is still alive. He's basically saying, Father, I want the things that are coming to me, the stuff, the material things, the money. I want it now. I don't want to have to wait till you die. I want the stuff that you can give me, but in actuality, I don't really care much about you. The younger son does not wait for his father to pass on his building frustration of his life, being stuck at home with his family, the boredom, the emptiness. And so he approached his father, please give me my share of inheritance, which would be half of his brothers, or about a third. He divided it, the father did, without fighting it, giving it to his younger son. And he gathered all that he had and went out and partied hard. We all are familiar with this story. He squandered it. He wasted it. Prodigal means wasteful. He wasted it in wild, reckless living. The son looked at his dad, knew he was physically alive, but to him he was as good as dead. He was like a living zombie. He had no heart, no love for the father. He saw the father as a means of getting the things that he felt would make him happy and more fulfilled. He wanted to reinvent himself with new rules, with new opportunities, with the money that he asked his father to give him. He felt that his current life was a dead one. He was looking for life and felt that if he could just be free and enjoy himself and put himself out there, if he could just change his circumstances of his life, he would be happy. There are a lot of us that I can identify with that. If my circumstances in my life could just change even just a little, I know that I would be happy. That's the heart behind this younger son. Finding life in the changing of circumstances so that he could truly be free. He wanted to be his own Lord, his own master, his own king, and find fulfillment through that freedom, changing his circumstances by having, at least for a fleeting moment, some wealth, power, and opportunity. And he was lost, and he ended up nearly destroying his life. He left not only the love of a father, but a love of a community that knew him and loved him, yet he rejected it all. It was not until he hit rock bottom, feeding pigs, looking at those pods that they were eating, longing for because he was so hungry, full of regret, and some measure of repentance, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that he decided to write his I'm sorry dad speech, driven mainly by hunger, and went back to his father with his tail between his legs, getting ready to rehearse that I'm so sorry 
speech. It was when he finally hit rock bottom that he came to his senses and made his journey home. I think there are a lot of us here that can look at our own lives or lives of those that we know and love and can identify with the heart and the struggle of the younger son, this prodigal boy. The son was lost and would soon be found. Secondly, we look at what Jesus shares about a life-changing embrace. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. While he was a long way off, Rembrandt captures for us in the well-known painting of this life-changing embrace. We often paint this story giving credit to the repentance of the younger son. But I believe that that is misguided. Here we have the father who is scanning the horizon with a heart full of love for his boy. Waiting for a son to come home one day. And here the son is practicing his I'm so sorry speech. And while he was still a long way off, the father casting all cultural expectations of being respectful and controlled and an elderly man threw caution out to the wind and ran like a crazy man to his son. What I forgot to mention in the first service is in my preparation looking at this passage It was not only because his heart was so longing to embrace his son, his boy, but it was also because if the villagers saw him before the father, they would have begun to pummel him, beat him up, shame him for what he brought to his own family and to their community. That's something I did not think of before. So his father shamelessly ran so that his son would not be shamed by others running with the passion and embraced them literally the phrases fell on his neck what's so fascinating about this embrace is the father if it was us we'd be arms folded like this cross waiting let me hear it let me hear it Are you truly repentant? Let's hear your speech. I'll see if it's good enough. Even before the son had an opportunity to give his I'm so sorry speech, the father has already given him an embrace. He receives him unconditionally even before the speech is given. That is the heart of the father. He gives it to him as an undeserving gift because we know if we were that parent we would definitely want to hear that speech we want to see a plan of change we want to see a way to pay back the money whatever we would come up with that kind of perspective would we not but even before he had a chance to truly fix up his life imagine what he looked like coming back home the father even before hearing that speech run and gives him the gift of forgiveness even before he had a chance to communicate that he was sorry i don't think the son in his actions was 100 percent repentful we often hear the story that oh what a dramatic repentance i think it was more regret and a little bit of repentance mixed in together. Just like us, not always do we have the purest of repentance before God and men. There's always a little bit of mix with regret and self-perspective and selfishness kind of all tangled up in there. I think that was the case in this younger son. 
And by embracing him unconditionally, even before he had a chance to give his well-prepared speech, the father himself bore shame as an older man doesn't run, and he absorbed the pain and the regret and the broken relationships into his own body as he embraced his son unconditionally. When you experience this kind of life-changing embrace, it does something to you. And we often don't operate like this, do we, in our lives for those that disappoint us, in our friendships, in our marriages, in our relationship to the church and other things. We keep a track of how we were hurt and wronged and we reciprocate, reciprocate depending on how we were treated. If you're really honest with yourselves, that's how you operate often with your own children, your friends, a church that wounds you, not intentionally, hopefully, in your marriages. We keep a track record how different the father is. Have you experienced this kind of unconditional grace, this embrace that is gifted to you undeservingly that utterly transforms this young son? I believe that it is only after this radical embrace that true repentance would finally begin in the son. The way in which you live your life, your attitudes, your relationships, he would be different. But it began not with the regret of, I'm so hungry, but an embrace by the Father. The third person that Jesus reveals to us in the story of the prodigal son is a second son, and I would like to commend to you that he is the second lost son. We often don't see it like that. We only focus on this terrible, rebellious, brat, punk, first younger son. No, the second lost son. Look, he says, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends and as you know though we didn't read the father through the party of all parties prepare the fattened calf they would feast on steaks celebrating through the night and here the older son look at his phrase look these many years i have served you i've never disobeyed your command this son was just as lost You just have to look a little bit more deeply to see his lostness. You see, his life, his obedience, his goodness was all done. What's the heart motivation behind it? That one day, if he just is good enough and does it right, he will get a payoff in the future in this inheritance. So he would work hard, he would follow the rules, he would honor his father, he wouldn't rebel ever. So one day he would gain his privileges, his rights, and his ability to truly enjoy life. He was using the father just like the younger son, but doing it in a different way. How many of us can relate to that? We work hard, we're industrious, we're faithful, we're courteous, we're disciplined, we're religious. Hopefully one day we will get that payoff in the future. And here we have the elder son. If he truly loved the father, he would celebrate when his brother returned. But we see resentment, anger, a duty-driven life, joylessness. He was after the blessings and the gifts and the things that the father one day would give him, not really treasuring the father. 
The shocking thing of this story is that both sons are just as lost, but their lostness just looks a little bit different. Both are separated from the father, even the one that lived at home, dutifully obeying, honoring. He was just as lost. Neither of them truly cared for the father. I've been a good person. I've worked hard all my life. I try to give God his due. Why hasn't this or that happened yet in my life? I deserve it. And we become resentful when life doesn't turn out as the way we feel we deserve to have. Pastor Tim Keller sums this up so well. The hearts of the two brothers were the same. Both resented their father's authority and sought ways of getting out from under it. One rebelled by being very bad and the other extremely good. Both were alienated from the father's heart. Both were lost sons. What kind of lostness can you identify with in your relationship to God and others? Is your lostness one of being out there in prodigal living? Or is it by being good and yet just as lost? I loved reading about Martin Luther, the great reformer, before he truly understood the grace of God. R.C. Sproul reflects on his life, and Luther says, I was a good monk. He was a good Catholic monk. I kept the rule of my order so strictly that Luther says, if I may say, if there was ever a monk that would go to heaven by his monkery, it was I. He would spend up to six hours a day in the confessional booth confessing his sins to the priest. Father, I've sinned. Last night I stayed up after the lights out time reading my Bible with a candle. I broke the rules. Forgive me. Yesterday at lunch, I coveted Brother Philip's potato salad. (laughs) Oh, I wanted just a few more potatoes. Until the head monk had to kick him out of the confessional booth because it was getting ridiculous. Trying to find God by pleasing the Father in your own goodness. It was not until he understand it was righteousness, acceptance by grace through faith in Christ that embrace would be given to him because of Jesus, not his own goodness that transformed him and launched a revolution. And we are here today in so many ways because of that discovery of the father's embrace and a man named Martin Luther. The gospel says that we might be really, really good people, but still be very radically lost and have darkness in our hearts. And that is offensive in our time and culture today. Aren't we all relatively good? I live my life like this older son. And yet we don't want the Father, we want the things the Father can do for us and bless us with, but we don't really do it with true love of the Father. Have you been embraced by him unconditionally? Do you know of that kind of love? You can grow up your whole life with a religious background, but be radically lost and not know the embrace of a Father. And so that brings us to, I believe, the real hero of our story. It's not in the repentance of the younger son who was rebellious and lost and finally came back home. No, I think it was more regret than repentance. He was hungry. But it was the running father. Look at the two phrases for both sons. But while he, the younger son, was still a long way off, he ran to his son. And how about the older son? So his father went out and pleaded with his older son. In both cases, the father is taking the initiative. He is running. He is going out. He's entreating them to return home to the father. Both sons were lost. 
The true hero, the true star of the show is not the younger son older, or the older son. It is a father who runs shamelessly in passionate pursuit of his lost children, whether they're in the house being good as they can or whether they are lost outside the house living wildly as they can. Both sons were lost, but only one knew that they were lost. I wonder which son was more appreciative of the father, the one who knew they were lost, or the one that had to be convinced that they were. So which brother are you? Do you know that you are lost? Do you see the pursuit of the running father chasing you, entreating you, and wanting to unconditionally embrace you? And if you're anything like me, we don't want to be embraced in that way because we want to do it better. We want to have it all together. We want the successes in our life before we feel we deserve to be embraced. It hurts our pride to be unconditionally hugged in that embrace. And we say, not yet, God, let me get it better when God is ready to welcome us home unconditionally. This leads us back to our new vision that whether you like chicken sandwiches or not, that God spoke to me while I was at Chick-fil-A and, and it's something that we're beginning to work through as a church that we desire to see us become a church for our city that pursues God and his passion for people through a launching of a movement of the gospel that begins here in Manchester and then our surrounding communities and then the world. And we've summed it up, pursuing God and his passion for people. Pursue God, pursue people. How are we going to see this really lived out? How are we going to see lives truly touched and changed both inside our house and outside as well equally? It is only when we capture the Father's heart. That heart is the necessary piece. It is the engine and fuel by which we live out our lives and live out in mission and service to Christ. And this morning, I would like to propose that the only way that we can capture the Father's heart, incarnated as we go out to pursue God and his passion for people, both inside the house and outside, is you have to be captured by the Father himself over and over and over again. The gospel is for those who are alienated, estranged, living in darkness, lost and are wandering. And whether you are not a Christian yet or you are a child of God in Jesus Christ by his grace, do you not also get lost time and time again in your life? See the running father with arms stretched out who embarrassingly, shamelessly ran in the person of Christ to be stripped naked, to die publicly on the worst form of execution, to bring shame to a person, to degrade their humanity in a Roman cross. Learn what it means to be embraced. Because once we are captured again by the Father's heart, we then can go out and power into our communities with that passion and heart that God himself has as we embrace and are embraced by him once again. What an opportunity that God has given to us and what an opportunity we have to do something in our generation and time that will bring glory to God and reach people for his kingdom. And so this is the heartbeat behind our vision. We must be captured by the Father's heart, and that Father's heart goes out as we pursue people. Over the next couple of weeks, we will expect greater things. And today we talked about the pursuit. We'll talk about greater endurance. It's a message that has been brewing 
almost from the moment that Kathy and I landed here two years ago, we moved from Chicago. Uh, I have some things I'd like to share regarding endurance, regarding generation to generation here at Trinity. And so that will be next Sunday, Acts chapter 2. We'll talk about greater power. Pastor Austin will take a theme that uh, we'll uh, share with you guys soon. We'll talk about greater impact, greater dreams. And I would like to do a fireside chat for those that are familiar with uh, what I believe President Roosevelt did during the war and after the Great Depression. Uh, it's a little opportunity to dialogue in a more interview style, and I'll share with you a little bit more of what that will look like, but this is what things will look like as we head toward the spring. And so please join us as we expect God-sized expectations for a new year. Let's pray.